All right, so I'm starting the recording. Uh, this is Wilma Hodges, and I will be facilitating today's teaching and learning call for September 16th. And um, on today's agenda, we're going to be doing a Jira Palooza. So we'll be um, taking a look at Jiras that folks have um, brought up to our attention to, to talk about. So we have a, a few in here. Some have been carried over a few weeks, um, but we have a few new ones as well that people had requested that we talk about. So if you have any additional ones that you want to go ahead and put into the Etherpad um, while we get going, uh, feel free to add your um, your items. And if we don't get them get to them today, we'll try to get to them at a future um, teaching and learning call. So I've placed the uh, Etherpad link in the chat. So if you haven't already gone to that and um, and signed in, please do. And um, as we usually do, we will go ahead and start off with some announcements and updates. So I would like to remind everybody that we are um, currently accepting proposals for the Sakai Virtual Conference. The proposal deadline is September 23rd, so that's a week from today, coming up fast. Um, and there's a link to the submission form in the um, in the Etherpad. I'll also paste it into the. Actually, I'll I'll paste the uh, web address for the the conference site into the chat. So that's been updated for this year. We're still adding information to it, but at least the basic stuff's up there and the links to register and stuff. Um, well, well, actually the link to the form for proposals is live. The registration link is not yet available because we're still kind of trying to figure out what we're going to do as far as um, registration cost. We want to have some low cost uh, alternatives for people because we know that this year is, is kind of an anomaly. Um, when it comes to professional development budgets, <laughs> so um, so we're still working that out. But um, but the call for proposals link is live off of the website there. Um, and I do encourage you to submit, um, particularly lightning talks. We'd like to get um, a, a couple of lightning talk sessions going if we get enough submissions to support that. And uh, and what we might actually do is make one of the sessions later in the day sort of an unconferency type of thing where people can sign up up to the last minute, um, like we've done at uh, Open Aperio when we have the live um, Open Aperio. We've done that, so we might try that at a uh, virtual conference. But um, first, I kind of want to see how many lightning talk submissions we get, and those are just short five minute presentations and um, it's kind of low stakes because you don't have to fill a whole half hour or you know 45 minutes it's just a five minute um, presentation on a topic um, and it could be a teaser for another session or it could be you know maybe an idea that you want to you know see if others um, are interested in and kind of get some momentum behind an idea so um, Anyway, all those are our options, so please uh, do put in your uh, submissions this week. Any other announcements from anybody else? I, I had a question about the sort of the placement of these um, lightning talks with respect to other sessions. Um, mm -hmm. Since you said you, know, you could use one potentially to promote another session, um, I and Jen uh, from ISU had submitted a um, proposal for a, a workshop session on accessibility and creating accessible content. Um, mm -hmm. And I was wondering if an, a lightning talk thing would be something we could use to promote that or that already happens before those. Well, the the schedule, which should, is, is subject to change, but the tentative schedule is to have a lightning session in the morning and then another one in the afternoon. Um, but it, so it kind of depends on when your presentation is, um, but you could potentially do it in the morning lightning talk um, as long as your presentation falls after that. Um, but like I said, we're still kind of tweaking the schedule because actually I was talking to Martin and, um, and Lamp has been doing these webinars um, to on different topics. And it just so happens that their next date is the same day as the virtual conference. And so we were going to kind of combine forces a little bit and do his webinar as part of our event. Um, so I'm having to shift the times around a little bit to accommodate that. So um, so there may be some change to the to the overall schedule. 
but um, anyway, short answer is maybe. So we'll have to see where your, your presentation falls. Okay. I mean, I guess it would fall under the pre-conference workshops because uh, it would be well, a workshop. Yeah. So. If it's more of a workshop workshop, not a presentation, yeah. then uh, I was planning to do those first thing like at 9 a.m. Mm -hmm. So that would be before any lightning talks, unfortunately. Um, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Oh, one other thing to mention, and some of you may already be aware of this if you've um, seen it on the dev list or if you've attended any of the core calls, um, but we did uh, have the code freeze recently that happened last week. And um, and that means that the code is kind of uh, all the, the features that are intended for 21 um, are, should be in in some form. Um, they may be in and there's still being, you know, bug fixes and, and things being done to improve them. But all of the major features have been kind of solidified. So um, so that's uh, the co code freeze has happened and that puts us on a good track to, um, to really ramp up QA over the next couple months and hopefully get a release out before the end of the calendar year. That's the plan. So, um, so we're still kind of on our, our good track to, um, to get that release out earlier than usual. So, um, okay, so let's go ahead and start off with our uh, Jirapalooza items. So we have a couple from Tiffany and let me, Tiffany, do you wanna share your screen or would you like me to share mine? Mm -hmm. Do you have a preference? Um, I tend to have problems with big blue button sharing screen, but I can try. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and try because I know it's tricky. Sometimes it's kind of annoying that way. So let yeah, me. Yeah, it tends to not like me very much. <laughs> All right, hang on a second. I'm going to share the screen. Got to drag a couple things around. Let me get my big blue button screen off of that monitor because. We don't want to see the infinite scroll there. <laughs> All right. I was wondering um, if you wanted to mention the LTI vendor spreadsheet that Josh created to um, sort of gather information about um, uh, pl tools plugged into people's sites or, or systems that they're using. Yeah, um, that was actually on the um, the user list. Um, Josh had put out a thread about trying to kind of get sort of crowdsourcing a list of all the different LTI um, integrations that people are using. So if you've not already seen that, I'll, I'll dig it out while um, while we're going over the first year and put it into the chat. But, I, I did. Oh, you did already. I awesome. Did put it in the Thank chat, you. Yeah. Great. Um, so. If you have items that are not already on that list, please go ahead and add them. And uh, and that way we can kind of crowdsource it and, and get as many of the items that we know about in there. What we we're gonna try to be doing over the next, you know, well, foreseeable future really is really reach out to a lot of the vendors that are doing LTI and um, and make sure that they're knowledgeable about Sakai and do whatever we can to you know make sure that you know if they have a list of LMSs that they support that Sakai is in that list on their you know, promotional materials and websites and making sure that um, you know any LTI 1.3 or LTI Advantage changes that are made um, that they're aware of those and can leverage them. So it's basically kind of an outreach um, initiative that we're doing. And Dr. Chuck has been instrumental in that. And um, and we're going to maybe even incorporate some sort of a panel into the virtual conference with some of the LTI vendors. That's kind of a, a hope. That was a um, an idea that came up yesterday at the core call. So uh, hopefully we can get some people committed to to come to that and um, and talk about some different LTI products that they um, that they produce and um, get a little bit of a dialogue going. So anyway, so yeah, please add to that form if you haven't already. So um, go ahead. We added a um, a column. Uh, Sam suggested in the mailing list that we add a column for um, to sort of capture usage. So I added a column for adding your institution. Um, as uh, you know, if the tool's in use there. Yeah, so it looks like this, right is, a bit. this is the list. And 
tool in use at. So yeah, put your institution if um, it's something that you guys use. And there's quite a few of them on here. So, but I know there's new LTIs popping up all the time. So if you know of any that aren't here already, please add to it. All right, great. A uh, question on that. Mm -hmm. if, if your tool is already listed there, do you want to know that um, who is using it? I mean, like how many people are using that tool? Yeah. Is that an yeah, important yeah. piece of information? Just add to this column and, you know, just put your institution as well as, as UVA so we know that. Okay, so it may not be just something that just we're using, but like WarpWire, how many people are using WarpWire kind of thing? Mm -hmm. so, okay. Terry, I, I, can, I can speak to that a little bit. Hey, guys. Um, you know, I, I think any contextual information like that that we have about usage is a good thing. I mean, at this point, I'm, I'm mostly concerned about getting the, the various tools represented so that we can do the next step, right, is to do outreach to them toward the end of the month and to say, hey, we're, we're planning this technical briefing on LTI with Dr. Chuck. You know, so I think that it's, it's good to know uh, where, you know, what institutions use various of these tools and potentially how much how much penetration they have. But it's uh, it, it's not it's not, you know, a must have in order to be able to take the next steps with this. So. So I think okay. if, you, if you have the information and can add it and it's not a burden, that's great. Um, okay. you know, but I think if it's a little bit hard, then, you know, it's it's okay to, to not make that a priority. Okay. That's helpful. But if it would be helpful, you know, it takes a couple of minutes to just go in. Yeah, we use this and we use that or we're going to use such. Yeah. I mean, I, I think institutional use probably seems to me to be more important than, uh, you know, user user levels, FTE levels. Uh, no, I meant to use but, institutional, yeah. Yeah. So I mean okay. I think you know if you if you have that information that you're you know that's handy, that would be great because certainly okay. when we talk to them, being able to say, well, there are 15 Sakai institutions that use your tool, you should right. deal with us. You know, that it's it's good for for you know negotiation. Okay. And I and I think it's important for leaning on those vendors that have heavy use that we are all frustrated with, like um for example, Panopto's horrible uh, having to log in by clicking on the tool situation. Um, you know, some of those uh, bugs that we've been complaining to these vendors about for many years, uh, if there are lots of institutions who are complaining about them, uh, maybe we can get them to finally fix them. Sure, you. absolutely. I mean, the, the first step is to open the lines of communication and then we can dig in on some of these issues, definitely. Yeah, and feel free to use the notes column. I'm just glancing through a few of these. So if you had a particular experience or maybe a, you know, one particular pain point that you want to note for people, um, feel free to add to the notes column and uh, detail that information so that we kind of have it captured somewhere. All right, anything else on the, um, the LTI stuff before we go into Jirapalooza? All right, I will take silences. Uh, nobody has anything else. Any other announcements? Last call for announcements. <laughs> All right, so we have um, a couple of uh, JIRAs from Tiffany. Um, Tiffany, do you want to take us through this first one and just kind of explain what the issue is? Sure. Um, so we were interested in at UVA in um, enabling the option for instructors to customize or for site owners to customize their site URL, um, which creates an alias for the site so that you can uh, point to a sort of prettier URL than having that long, ugly, um, random site ID as part of your URL. Uh, but I found a number of usability issues with it, namely being caused by the fact that you can set multiple aliases for the same site. And um, what it does if you create an alias is it, that it doesn't let you edit it properly, even if you have the editing uh, realm permission enabled properly. Um, it uh, sort of adds a new one, tacks a new one onto the same site each time you 
you go to add aliases. And this generates not only a whole bunch of different URLs for the same site, but also different email addresses for the same site in the email archive tool, um, which is problematic because you don't want the same site taking up, you know, a hundred aliases that nobody else can then use. <laughs> um, so part of the question is, I mean, frankly, I think we should make it limited to only one alias per site, but from that, the, the question that comes out of that is how many institutions are using this feature and how many of them need multiple aliases per site? Uh, is there a use case for having multiple aliases per site? Um, and if so, would it be detrimental to those existing sites uh, to have it stripped down to one? This is where consistency and standardization would do us well if we if we had some kind of overarching principle that said that because we have the alias, perhaps it's not exactly the same thing, uh, but email archives acts in a similar fashion in that you can turn the tool off and turn it back on and you don't know what its email alias was before you, so you can assign it another one. Uh, I think yep. both of these, both of these should function in that only one alias is assigned and whether you turn the tool off and turn it back on, you should pop into the UI the existing alias. Yeah, so that's that's the uh, one of the problems that relates to this. So they are aliases. Um, they're actually a separate, sort of a separate place of alias in that email archive uh, generates itself uh, an alias that includes mail archive in the URL. And the site URL just includes like site and the alias. Um, that must so, be a customization for UVA because- No, it's it, not. It's not. That's how it works if you enable the uh, property to create site aliases uh, for on the user side. So there are two properties, site manage enable alias new and site manage enable alias edit. And then associated with those two properties are realm permissions that allow the instructor or you know, site owner, whoever in the site uh, has that permission to do that editing. Uh, they also need site.upd because the editing of the site alias takes place in the um, site info, um, you know, site information display area of site info. Um, How do these permissions relate to the name of, of it? They, they allow the instructor to create the aliases in, in site info for the site URL. So there, there are oh, two separate but, aliases. There's, there's the email archive alias, which the instructor can set just by adding the tool. And then there's the site URL alias, which has to be enabled for the instructor to be capable of setting it. Yes, we were but getting off on of a little bit of a tangent in that I thought I heard you say that email aliases had to have the word email archive in the alias. No, when you search for the alias in the um, administration workspace aliases tool, you will find that the mail archive has its own sort of alias um, URL uh, that differs from the site URL. The weird thing about this is that if you set an email archive alias by adding the tool to your site you know earlier on and then you go to try to set a site url that alias is already associated with the site and the mail archive so it can't be used as the site url which is really stupid um <laughs> oh my goodness conversely conversely if you set a site url it automatically becomes also an email address for the site so that's what's so ridiculous about this is that you can set multiples, you can set them in different places, and then they kind of interact in bad ways. <laughs> yeah, well, do you agree that that um, if you're going to have an alias for the site, that that would be the logical name for your email archive as well and yep. vice versa? I do exactly. too. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I do there too. Just be, and oh, by the way, the web dev URL also comes out of this. So if you set an email archive alias, uh, that becomes your web dev URL, you know, part of your web dev URL string. 
uh, for resources and, and file drop or Dropbox mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. web dev. And if you set another alias in, in site info uh, for the site URL, then the second one that was set takes over as the web dev URL. So your web dev URL could potentially change if you keep adding these stupid aliases. <laughs> this is all too much spaghetti. It needs to be simplified and exactly. made consistent. That's exactly well, what I'm saying. So we should have just one alias per site. It can act as the site URL if that feature is enabled. It can act as the site email uh, address if the email archive tool is added. And it can act as the web dev URL and just one per site. <laughs> Why would yes. we allow an instructor or a maintain user to keep renaming a site over and over again anyway? Shouldn't it just block that? No, I think it's fine to have it rename the Why? email alias because because well, yes, the, because it it, it's not it's it. arbitrary. So yeah. it, it's really arbitrary. So you know the the site is still when it receives email, Sakai is still using the site ID. Okay. to um to handle that email and you know everything else you know it's all using the site id so this is just kind of a cosmetic thing that routes things through it uh, so that the user doesn't have to see the the hideous uh <laughs> site id but yeah so so adam brings up a question could the alias simply be configured by the instructor from site info in a single place um so the um if the user has not set an alias in site info, then they should be able to set it for the email archive. Now at UVA, we have a customization that email archive automatically generates um, an email alias upon creation of the site based on the, the site title. And it also, uh, with our site builder uh, functionality, automatically tacks on numbers at the end if the user or if the alias already exists in the system and the user is trying to use the same uh, site title as a previous version of their site. Um, so it's, it's got a little bit smarter naming of that uh, email alias URL, but it was in exploring uh, the desire to turn this feature on for instructors to set a site URL that I discovered that th it creates these multiple URLs and aliases, um, and I, I think that's not good. And so I wanted to sort of explore if other institutions feel a need for multiple aliases per site, you know, because in that case, maybe a, um, a property could be uh, created to allow those couple of institutions who like having multiple aliases per site to, you know, continue to do that. Um, but Largely, I think we need to strip it down to a single alias per site, and then um, wherever you edit it, whether you edit it in site info or you edit it in email archive, that alias is changed in both places or all three places, I guess, because web dev, site info, you know, site URL, and, and email uh, alias. Hip hip hooray! Hip hip hooray! This Jirapalooza is going to make this system better, more consistent, more intuitive. Yeehaw! All right, so we're all for this Jira. Do we need to comment on it at all about uh, a recommendation of what we want to do? Or Exactly. Yeah, so the recommendation yeah. would be that there should be a single alias per site. Um, Arg. And then, and then it, that... that yeah, and then that alias could be edited in both places where email or where aliases are currently capable of being edited. So either email archive or site info. Right. So if it's already been added, it should just appear there and but still allow editing from any of yeah. those locations. Exactly. Yep. OK, I can add that comment on there. Thank you, Tiffany, for Sniffing Thanks. this out and clarifying how all the different ways that it can go bad. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's it's um it's a feature that you know we've had requested once in a while uh, by instructors to not have that hideous uh, email string, and of course we can set the alias for them in the sites tool, um, but um, 
you know, we wanted to enable it for instructors because it is a property that's there. But um, when when we tested it out, we found these sort of bad usability issues with it. And, and you know, the ability, like I said, to generate multiples for one site would sort of lock them out of use from other sites. And I don't think that's good. Cool. Okay, so I'm commenting on this. Um, actually, let me take it to another screen. So you guys don't have to watch me type. Um, <laughs> we can go ahead and start on the second one in the list if you guys want to go over that one. That's another one of Tiffany's. So if you'd like to explain it for us. Yeah, so this is um, something that came out of um, our experience with adding the GradeScope LTI in our system. Um, in GradeScope, when you uh, create uh, an assignment and send it to uh, the Sakai Gradebook, um, it creates this item uh, and it's locked by GB REST, a service called GB REST. And so the instructor, when they go to Gradebook and, and they see that little lock and click on it, it says, go to GB REST to edit this tool or to edit this grade or to edit this title or whatever. And that's frustrating because you don't know what GB REST is. Um, but on top of that, you can't actually edit it at all. So um, if I go to Gradescope, now that I see that I have to go to Gradescope um, to do this editing, I change the title of the Gradescope assignment and I save it. Uh, the title in of the item in Gradebook corresponding to it has not changed. If I go to Gradescope, I change the total point value of the assignment and I sync the grades. The total points are not updated um, and the total point value hasn't changed. So now if I've, let's say I've turned a 10 point assignment into a 100 point assignment, and graded my students in grade scope and I send the grades to the grade book, they could have 90 out of 10 and you know massive amounts of grades. <laughs> um, so that's not good. Uh, and um, you know, GB REST, if it's going to lock the assignments, needs to make them editable. Oh, by the way, you also can't remove these grade book items. So even if you delete the assignment that corresponds to the item in grade scope, you cannot delete the corresponding grade scope item. Yep. Yep. So, or grade book item, I guess I should say. So yeah, so th this is something that I think is a very serious problem, um, especially if we get into more, as we get into more um, uh, tighter LTI 3 or whatever it is, 1.3, I don't know, integrations. Um, I think more uh, LTIs are going to be using the the GB REST service to uh, deliver and lock um, grades and items, and uh, so I think this needs to be resolved before that starts to happen. Um, before we end up with a mess where instructors really have no option or recourse to get rid of the gradebook item uh, except for hiding it from students and not including it in the course grade and then regenerating it as an entirely new assignment with a new name, because of course you can't change the name, so you're stuck with that name. <laughs> yeah. So it's just it's just a really bad situation unless you have a developer go in and forcibly delete it. Uh, well, what it'll do if you don't change the name coming from Gradescope is it sends over the, the item, but then it adds uh, some alphanumeric something or other to the end of it, so it's got this really weird suffix to the name oh so it, i was not aware of that yeah well it's um it's a little different from that uh i just handled a ticket with this the other day uh, but um the cool thing is is that this is an example of gradescope working with us to have this fixed and uh, i will go ahead and put this message that I received in here. Um, Gradescope's plan for fixing it is they're actively working on LTI 1.3 and they're hoping that the new features of 1.3 will sufficiently replace the use of the Sakai GB REST API. So that's good news coming. And I will put that in the uh, in the JIRA so that um, it looks like Dr. 
did you assign it to Dr. Chuck Tiffany or did he? It it's an automatic assignment because it's a LTI um, component. Oh sure, sure. So okay. once once somebody puts an accessibility component, it comes to me. Once somebody puts a LTI component, it goes to him. Yeah, I'll um I'll paste that in because uh, they probably could use some help from him. So uh, I just added um, Karen Ling is the software engineer for Gradescope who was responding to um, the Laura's colleague, Kale Kanzuski. So there you go. All right, another one, huge. Great, another one. Dan. Yeah, I, I think this one is uh, potentially a problem for other LTIs as well. I agree. Um, you know, even if even if Gradescope is working um, to fix it on their particular side, um, I feel like it's an important um, consideration to work on for other um, other potential uh, providers. And everyone who agrees with us, vote for this JIRA. Ra. <laughs> <laughs> so Laura, were you going to comment at, at the bottom of this one? I put the TL review label on it just so we know we talked about it. Oh, OK. I um, You put the TL reviewed, right? Yep, I mm -hmm. see it. Yeah. Uh, but if you could add a comment kind of summarizing. Will do. Great. Thank you. All right, anything else on this one? All right, moving on. So our next one in the list is uh, is one that Michael Green had asked for us to talk about. I don't see him on the call today. I think this one came up at the tail end of the um, core call yesterday. And it was about the color contrast in um, Become User. There's a, um, a color change that happens in the banner when uh, you become user. And, um, and I actually created this JIRA a few months back um, because I was I went in there and I uh, looked at the, the become user and I thought that the contrast here was was pretty bad between the blue and the green. So um, I didn't flag it as accessibility because it was just the image that was bad contrast. Um, but I put it in there as hey maybe we could use a different color. Um, so I guess Michael had applied a different color. He put a purple on it. Uh, but then um, in talking about it a little bit more, people started saying, well, you know, maybe color contrast isn't sufficient to indicate that kind of change. And um, because if it's, uh, you know, if, if the admin user has difficulties with color, it's not really going to signal to them anything um, that they're using become user. And also Tiffany pointed out that uh, sometimes she uses it to display how things should look. Um, for uh, support. So um, in revisiting, so, go ahead. Did you want to add? So to I actually thought this was a bug in, mm -hmm. in the nightly servers when I became user. I didn't realize that it was a result of become user. Um, mm -hmm. I thought it was a horrible bug that it was changing the color of the banner and, <laughs> and, and just being ugly. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, so, I found it kind of ugly myself. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so I'll go um, to the I, trouble to log out and log back in as someone just so I don't, I don't have to look at the green. <laughs> yeah, I was not aware that that was being caused by anything in particular. I just thought it was a bug that, you know, users had a different color banner than admin. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but we at UVA, when we do, when we use become user, we use it a lot for screenshots to show users what they should be seeing. And I think it'll be a big problem if the banner is changing colors, um, you know, at all when we want to use it for that, or if it displays anything else on the screen visually uh, for admins than users. I think that's bad because we don't want to tell users we've become them. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, I, I think that it should be adequate. I mean, currently, if you look at the user menu and you go to the logout, 
the log out does not say log out. It says, you know, go return to so-and-so dash admin or whatever your admin username is. Um, well, I think the concern was that we've had some instances where people had admin rights, but they um, didn't realize that they were logged in as admin when they performed certain tasks. So there definitely is a, a a group of folks that want to be alerted. And so what I was thinking, and this is just a suggestion, um, and I, I mocked this up using the banner um, PA option, just maybe if we had something at the top that could easily be cropped out of a screenshot, if you're taking hmm. screenshots, you could just crop from here down and it would look just like a normal user, but up at the very top, it would alert people that they're logged in as someone else and it would tell them, you know, you're logged in as that person. So, you that know, who, good. Yeah, who that's you're good. Do we have something yeah, I like, like that, that for student view as well? I forget. No, um, no, but it might be before. useful for student view oh as well. Oh my gosh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Would, yes. Never yeah, I like that. That's a good solution. Yeah, that was a good point. We had actually had a color change. Um, actually, I think it was in the the breadcrumb bar to indicate student view. Yeah. Um, and that was useful because it cut down on the number of calls that I would get <laughs> saying, I can't do such and such. Exactly. Way. Exactly. Are you a student view? And you can hear the, the face, the head slap, face <laughs> ball over the phone. Well, God bless them <laughs> when they do that, when they exit view, view, for some reason they think they have to choose their role again from the drop down instead of the guys just knowing <laughs> that they're instructed. We get that question quite a lot too. Like, well, oh, yeah, we got that too. Now. Recently. <laughs> no, it knows who you are. So it's okay. Just exit the view and go about your business. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I like the solution to have it as a separate banner at the top. Um, you know, if you're viewing the site as a student or you're or you're viewing the site as a TA or, you know, whatever your thing is up at the top. I like that. Okay, cool. Well, I, I'll propose that to, to Michael and the rest of the folks and see if um if they can make that happen instead of the color change because the color change is a little um disconcerting if you're not ready for it so yeah i mean i found it jarring um like i said as if it were a bug but i also think it it would be bad for you know trying to get um screenshots for users because we very often do uh you know take a screenshot of that banner to show them go to my sites to find your site or <laughs> whatever <laughs> um and i don't want to be sending them a green <laughs> banner instead of a blue yeah. one or you know whatever it is uh because that'll be uh, confusing. Okay, cool. I will we'll comment on this one after um, after the call, so I'm not typing while we're talking. Any other thoughts on this one, by the way? We should probably make a separate one um, for student view, if you guys like the banner idea. Um, if you like, I can create a new JIRA and request yeah. that we do that for student Great. view. Great, thank you, Wilma. Yeah. Okay. I'll um, do I don't know about the accessibility of it for screen readers. Um, it would have to have like maybe an Aria Polite on it or something so that it's not, you know, hounding them on every page they're on, but right, <laughs> it's, still, right. it's still apparent uh, to them. But um, yeah. Okay, cool. I'll get that done after the call. All right. So let's see, what's our next item? Um, Teams integration. This was one that um, that Daniel had asked that we talk about, um, and we talked about it before. I think we had um, we had Miguel do a little bit of, or Miguel was going to do something, and then he couldn't be there, and so I think Josh and I kind of talked about it. But basically, um, he wanted to get more feedback from the teaching and learning group to see if there's interest in a Teams integration. And um, we're bringing it up again just to kind of test the waters again and see if there's interest. So of the yeah. folks here, who would be interested in a Teams integration? I think UVA would. Uh, we've just now had uh, several classes sort of piloting using Teams. And right now, uh, they all have on their uh, Sakai sites telling the students to go to Teams instead of Sakai. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so UVA would be interested. Anybody else? 
we might potentially be interested as well. Um, okay. Exactly what it did. We all actually also have some. Um, we also have some faculty piloting, at least using Teams in some fashion in association with their courses this semester. Okay. Providence College might be interested as well. We're under somewhat of an institutional push to evangelize teams, even though I feel Zoom is a far superior tool. But uh, I am going to be on the Microsoft Fast Track meeting in order to create team sites using our SIS data the same way that we do for Sakai. So we, we do use Zoom as well. Um more heavily, of course, than Teams, but I think uh, there's some appeal in Teams for, you know, collaborative Microsoft uh, stuff that people are using, um, you know, and they may use it more like Slack or something like that uh, mm -hmm. than, than using, you know, Zoom, which they may use in addition to Teams uh, for their classes. Right. Okay, and it looks like Duke did a little bit of testing um, around it, so I'll, I'll go ahead and add Duke to the list. So I have UVA, ILSTU, Providence. Was there anybody I missed? Okay, I just made some notes in our Etherpad. Um, I'll relay that information to uh, to Daniel to see um, if he wants any more follow up on that. But personally, I think it would be good to have just because a lot of other LMSs have it. And so it, it you know, keeps parity on that level um, with some of these different platforms. There are a lot of Microsoft schools out there. So um, it's nice to have it as an option at least. Okay. So I will mark that as reviewed. Um, all right, so the next one on our list is um, allow users greater control over attachments. So this is another one of Tiffany's. You want to acquaint us with this issue? Sure. Um, so in a number of tools, uh, this applies to email archive, tests and quizzes, um, announcements, um, I'm trying to think of some others, potentially in assignments, I'm not entirely sure there. Um, instructors and students uh, and or students can upload attachments for various purposes. And uh, those attachments go into a magical area that the instructor cannot see in content um, uh, that lives within the tool somewhere uh, in its attachments area. And it can't be deleted by the user. So that file is kind of hanging around. And if the instructor <laughs> sends an email to their support site, yeah, arg, uh, <laughs> magical and mysterious and totally obfuscated, Laura says. Um, yeah, so, so it goes into this attachments area. And let's say the instructor inadvertently sends something via email to their site that they do not want to send to their site. And they realize it immediately. So because email archive, when it sends an email, is not actually sending the attachment to the users, it's sending a link to the attachment to the users. Um, the instructor thinks they can delete that email from the archive and the attachment's gone. And that seems like a very logical decision, but the attachment does not get cleaned out. It hangs out in the system. So students can still access it, uh, even though the instructor has, you know, theoretically deleted it, um, and you know the link is still active, so that's that's a problem <laughs> because the only way for the instructor to turn it off is to turn off all student access to all content in the site, i.e., resources and every tool and attachments in every tool. Um, so they actually have to write to support and have a developer remove this offending attachment. And similarly for a quiz. Um, if you have uh, deleted, um, you know, you want to delete an attachment from it, you know, the attachment is still potentially somewhere in the system. Um, so that's that's not very nice. And so, and, and the same thing for students. So if a student uploads, um, you know, an attachment to like a forum or something like that, it, it may hang around um, even after 
the attachment has been removed from that um, post theoretically. Uh, and so, yeah. Yeah. Um... I think we could uh, get more votes for this issue if we uh, if we changed the language on it to be um, more one of a difficulty with intuition and workflow and training. Uh, that's what we're running into at Notre Dame is that, well, even remembering for us, there's so many different ways this hidden obfuscated place affects uh, the end user mm -hmm. not just not just in um, in having orphans out there that no one can find but more in uh, I can't remember as an instructor from time to time what what those attachments are and what other dependencies exist to making them visible, what happens to them when I import to a new semester, if I use the question in a question pool and I use that pool from, I mean, there's just way too many implications that aren't transparent to the end user be, because they, they don't know this exists. Yeah. It, um, so I'm really interested in what you propose as the solution. So what I'd like to see is some place where um, the instructor or the student, whoever owns that file, whoever uploaded that file, is capable of seeing that stuff has been uploaded there. So let's say a tab in assignments like attachments you uploaded to assignments or attachments you uploaded to quizzes. Um, and then the user can go in there and, you know, assuming it's it's something that the instructor has allowed removal of when it comes to students, um, you know, they can go in there and, and remove it. What uh, about a model that we may have a model already? What about um, the way through the interface you add a style sheet to lessons and then it automatically creates that hidden folder for you? Well, it doesn't create a hidden folder. It creates a folder in resources when you upload stuff to the lessons. That um, folder I is being that... visible by default. No, not visible to students, though. Yeah, yeah, it's visible to students unless the instructor goes in there and edits its property to make it. Oh, hidden, oh, I thought it was hidden. Visible. I don't know why mm -hmm. I thought it was hidden. No, but... it just it just populates resources with folders. All of lessons when you upload something via lessons. Uh, populates resources with a bunch of folders, which uh, which brings like which brings another question of um, people not attaching things at in assignments or tests and quizzes or whatever without first uploading it to resources. Well, because they shouldn't. They shouldn't yeah. be uploading it to resources. Well, uh, and, and the, and the no, actually, they should. No, they should. No, I think I think they should not be uploading an attachment to resources that lives in a test because I don't want my students to be able to access that until they're taking the test. Well, but if you're not it's making it hidden, <clears throat> right, you're going to hide it. Yeah, that, so, so search doesn't obey. If you make the folder hidden but contents visible, search does not care about that and will reveal it to students. Well, well search well, should care. It should yes. care, but it doesn't. Well, um, let's fix that that's a different too, issue. While we're at it. That, that is a different issue. Let's but um, that too while we're at it. But it's hard to have. Um, you know, to track down all of the documents that are in all of these other places for it not to be centralized in resources, um, you can lose track of a, an attachment well, or whatever so, anywhere. So I don't think I don't think it's beneficial uh, to force a file to be uploaded to resources because, for example, when we're talking about question pools, the question pool handling of attachments is actually quite excellent now. Uh, whereas we used to have a ton of problems with it. So now when you upload an attachment uh, to a question pool, it's it's living in the attachments area of the question pools and you can access it properly from other sites where you're an instructor and have access to those pools and can, can use import those questions into tests cleanly. 
Um, so actually, I would encourage now, now that many of those problems have been fixed, instructors to attach files to things in question pools so that they can be imported without issue to new sites. I'm uh, finding that things get lost when they're not in resources that um, that because it seems a lot of times that I, I'm, I'm finding lately anyway that when somebody doesn't have something in resources it gets lost in iteration. T Terry I'm sympathetic to what you're saying but uh, in the JIRA Tiffany raises a point where imports to tests and quizzes imports images to attachments. So if you import IMS QTI and that IMS QTI has an image, the import to Samago isn't going to put those images in resources, it's going to put it in tests and quizzes. So getting back to Tiffany's initial JIRA, I'm sympathetic in trying to provide an interface to faculty in order to give them greater control over this mysterious area that's not exposed in the same way that resources is. But my concern if we do this is with great power comes great responsibility. I'm fearful that faculty may inadvertently delete an image which was uploaded to tests and quizzes and then when students do an administration they wonder why they can't see a picture that's a good point and and maybe they should be locked right so so maybe in this this magical attachments area if we can expose it to users we could also have a lock on those items that are currently occupying uh, positions in quizzes or assignments and then have a link pointing directly from that sort of attachments tool um, to to jump over to that thing. Now, if you currently upload an attachment in resources and then attach it to a quiz, it's actually creating a copy of that file in the quiz. You're attaching a copy, not attaching the original. So if you update the one in resources, you're not updating the one in the quiz. So I, well, I frankly think, me, I think that it, sucks. Uh, so yeah. I think it's I think it's really important to maintain, because instructors do not want to put their quiz content in resources. And I think that's perfectly reasonable, and I think that's appropriate. Um, and the reason for that is that when the content is living in a quiz attachment, Samago is also handling a hidden permissions set. So if the attachment link is attempt if the student attempts to access the attachment link uh, from Samago when the quiz is closed and no feedback is released to the student uh, then that link won't work but it will work if you have it in a folder and resources that's hidden but allows access to contents so I think instructors need to do a lot more work if they're using resources to house these materials than they do if it's just in contained as an attachment in the quiz or the assignment or the whatever it was attached in. And, and I think that, um, you know, no, actually, David does not have only to do with its Samago attachments. Anytime you attach a file that is living in resources to an attachment area of a tool, you will see that the link says, make a copy of this attachment. It does not say, attach this file link. Right, so but what, if, if I go through and I replace a file inside of resources that I'm actually using in a lessons area, is it well, making a copy in the lessons area as well as replacing the copy that I've told it to replace? So I have no, faculty lessons that is their syllabus lessons is different from area, and then after they go through and they, they update their syllabus, they just replace the file in resources. That is a really good time saver. So I don't have to yeah, go well, through so, and down in so the lessons, lessons area where it's used. Lessons behaves differently from these attachments tools. Lessons does not attach the file to itself. It uploads the file and resources and references it. So announcing a copy of it? Yeah. Why are assignments working differently? So if I put an attachment in announcements, mm -hmm. then it is be, because the I've actually put it in resources point. first, because I've put it in resources first, yeah. then when if I you, make the announcement and point to that attachment, it actually makes a copy of it? Yeah, so if you look at the link when you're when you're creating that attachment, uh, if you go to the attachments area in any of those tools and use that kind of file picker attacher thing, um, that that link in that um, attachment um, UI actually says make a copy. It doesn't say, you know, link this attachment. Uh, and, That's a and problem. Lessons, Lessons, yeah, is behaving, lessons behaves differently. 
the yeah, but that's a, that's a problem with the stuffing. way that the attachment works. The attachment should be linking to wherever whatever your no. resource is. No, if a student if a student has it in their home sites, my resources, and they yeah. do it to an assignment, the instructor would never be able to access it That's unless right. the student makes it public. So yeah. I right. think it's appropriate to use it as an attachment copy. Yeah, yeah I agree. With I, it sounds to me as if there's a difference between making a resource publicly available and hyperlinking to it versus pointing to a resource as an attachment and sending it. When you do yep. it as an attachment, it clones the resource. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah, and, and so I think it's appropriate in some of these cases for that attachment to live within the tool's own content area because of, of access that you want to restrict, right? You want your assignment links to only be active once the assignment's active. You want your quiz content to only be accessible when the student's taking the quiz or reviewing the feedback, assuming you've made that feedback available. Um, so so I think it's it's appropriate to, and, and also especially for email, like it's not right if you delete the email from the archive that the attachment isn't gone. <laughs> that needs to be cleaned out. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I agree I, that I agree people that, would have. Say we had issues with this sort of an attachment issue when we had the modules tool way, way long ago. Yeah. Faculty would go through and attach things to the tool, and you couldn't ever get access to them by reference in another tool area because, because they were subsumed in the other tool's database. Yeah. Well, and, I worry so I think, about having too many different containers for files. I think just from a cognitive load perspective, people are going to get really confused right. about where the file lives. I mean, right now there's no confusion because they can't get to them. <laughs> They're just invisible. They're in this this mystery place. But I think if each tool has its own container of files, that's going to present a UI issue. Well, I mean, already it does have its own container of files, but you know, maybe it should just clean them out when they're deleted properly. You know, it's right now, it's not cl cleaning them out. Um, yeah. I so, think so we're, we're out of time, to... unfortunately. I don't think we've solved this one. So I propose that we put this same one on um, for next time and talk about it a little bit more and kind of work through some potential solutions. Because I, I think it's definitely a problem that needs to be addressed, but I don't think we have time to do it in today's meeting. It's a good idea. It, yeah, we Sounds need to good. talk about it a little more. Yeah, Thank so I'll, I'll carry this one over for our next uh, time. And uh, incidentally, our next two meetings are open. We don't have anyone scheduled. So if anybody has something that they would like to present on or there a particular topic they'd like to hear about, let me know. And I'll um, be happy to either add you to the schedule or see if I can find somebody to um, present on your preferred topic. So. Um, please let me know. And uh, I believe for those of you who usually attend the UX call, um, there is a UX call right after this starting now um, in room three. So I'm going to pop over there uh, and hopefully I'll see a few of you there with me. Take Thanks. care, guys. Have a great day. You too. Bye.